Hello and welcome again to uh, Bible study at Christ Church. Uh, today we continue our study of 2 Peter and we begin with prayer. Father, we thank you for the gift of your word, the scripture, Lord, but especially the word made flesh, Jesus, the Son of God. We pray, Lord, that our study today would help us to learn about your will and your purposes, but especially would help us to grow more and more as followers of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. So friends, we're making our way through our study of Second Peter. You'll remember that Second Peter is written by the Apostle Peter to a church in central and upper, what was then called Asia Minor. Today, it's modern-day Turkey the church in Galatia and Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, Pontus. Uh, this is a church that we know from history was a church that was under attack. This is a church that was dealing with uh, real persecution. And so first and second Peter are both letters of instruction and they're letters of encouragement to the church in that part of the world. So it began, you remember, this introduction with Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Christ to those who've obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he identifies himself as the author in a tone that is humble and gracious. Remember the word he uses for servant can also be translated slave. The word apostle means simply one who is sent, an apostle of Christ, one who has been sent by Christ into the world to tell others about Jesus. He's writing to a church that he holds to, to have equal standing with himself, not because of their own merits, but because of the righteousness of the Lord and wishes them this traditional Christian greeting, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in and through the knowledge of God and of Christ. This beautiful introduction. And then you remember 2 Peter 1, verse 5 and 7, he writes, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control, self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. And this section of 2 Peter 1, the apostle uh, calls them to the virtuous life. The language he uses, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, i.e. it's not a replace, virtue is not a replacement for faith. It's not either or, it's not either you, you trust in the Lord or you live a virtuous life. What he's saying is, no, if you're a believer, this is what you invest yourself in. This is how you grow. This is where you aspire to be, to be virtuous and knowledgeable and self-controlling and steadfast and godly and loving believer. These virtues are beautiful. We, they're not uncommon, uh, both in the ancient world and in the early church. The word that we translate here, virtue, overall, is, is a broad word, arete, which means moral excellence. So he says, make every effort to, effort to supplement your faith with moral excellence. We hear the same teaching from Paul to the Philippians in Philippians 4.8. And then virtue with, with knowledge and knowledge with self-control. This word self-control I put this in the notes, involves the restraint of your emotions or desires or impulses. And it assumes that those are impulses or desires that are not of God, that are not of the Lord, that don't honor the Lord. Um, and self-control with steadfastness. The word here is hypomone, which means a, a, a deep kind of patience to hold up or bear up in difficult circumstances. So this is a word that doesn't simply mean be patient when you have to wait for the light to turn green. It means no, it, it, this word hypomone means to bear up in the midst of difficult circumstances, which we knew, which he knew, and we know that the church in that place at that time in history was certainly enduring. 
So in godliness with brotherly affection, the word godliness is eusebia. Um, and the word brotherly affection is one of the classic words for love in Greek, Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Brotherly affection with love. Philadelphia speaks to the love for the saints. So it's this beautiful, beautiful word that calls the church to the virtuous life. And then verse 10 Therefore, Adolfoi, brothers and sisters, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, which is the virtues he just listed, you will never fall. I.e., if you, if you faithfully live, then you won't fall away in your faith. He's really challenging them to, to not think about their faith in terms of a belief system simply, but of a belief system that's accompanied with an entire lifestyle. And he's saying, as you practice living faithfully, that you're just less likely to fall away. It's like anything else. It's muscle memory. As you continue to endure, taking step after step after step, you're not going to lose the path because you're on it. Um, it's just a, 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 beautiful, a beautiful encouragement to the church in that part of the world. Uh, to confirm your calling and election, um, we hear similar language. Uh, Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Romans 9, 11. Uh, it's really a reference to how people became believers. And, uh, and ultimately, in the same way that Peter became a believer, because Jesus called him to follow him, right? Cast down your nets, you know, put aside your nets. I'll make you a fisher of men, Peter. I'm calling you to follow, to follow me. And he was chosen. The word election is this word. He was chosen by the Lord in the same way that Abraham was chosen, in the same way that you and I were called by the Lord and chosen by him to, to follow after him. We're not Christians because we were smart enough to figure it out. I mean, we are accountable for our own choices. But at the end of the day, what he reminds the church of is that they were called and elected by the Lord. It's an encouraging word. It's saying God loved you enough to call you, loved you enough to choose you and claim you. And it says, therefore, be faithful. Therefore, be diligent. Therefore, practice these virtues and you won't fall away in your faith. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is how you know that you're a Christian. You know you're a Christian because you're following Jesus. And it's, it, it's akin to the traditional theology in the church that we call perseverance of the saints, which sometimes, you know, uh, uh, gets a little overdone. But the principle behind that is, is fairly simple. You know, that if you're a believer, it's going to show. In the same way, we, we, we looked at this last week, that Matthew 7 reminds us that it, being faithful to Jesus isn't just using words. It's about a life that reflects that the words are true. Um, and Jesus says, uh, the one, you know, who does the will of my father who is in heaven is the one, you know, who will enter the kingdom of heaven. We continue verse 12. I love the language that he uses here in verse 12. It's this, we'll call this the loving reminder. He writes, therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, i.e. the virtues that he's listed, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. I think it right, as long as I'm in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. Just a beautiful reminder to the church to be who they're called and equipped to be. Remember what they've learned and be faithful to the Lord. He says, I think it right, as long as I am in this skenoma or skenoma, which we translate tent, I mean, we translate body because that's what, that's the sense of it. But the literal word is tent. He says, I think it right as long as I'm in this tent to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that by the putting off of my tent will be soon, i.e., 
he absolutely has a sense that his identity as a human being is not wrapped up in his body, that his body is a tent, that his person is the soul. It's what is inside. And while the body will fail and the body will come to death, the person, the soul inside of us will live forever. And he it writes this encouragement to them. As long as I'm in this tent, I'm writing to stir you up. <laughs> I love that. We This last Sunday, last Sunday was the third Sunday in Advent. And the clergy often, we nickname that Sunday, Sunday Stir Up Sunday. Because the, the collect for the day for Advent 3 every year is stir up thy power, O Lord, and with great might come among us. And it's just this idea that, you know, let's let's stir it up and go. And Peter's writing the church to stir them up, to encourage them, to light a fire under them, to remind them. Uh, why? Because he knows that his time among them is short. He doesn't have a lot of time to write them more letters. He doesn't expect he's ever going to be able to go and travel to see them. And so he's writing this letter to them out of love as a reminder because he knows that his time is short. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, he's referring to his death as a departure, that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. So it's just a great legacy gift, these letters. I mean, he, he absolutely, Peter has a sense of his pending death and out of love for the church is writing them these letters just to remind them once again of the love that God has for them, the plan that God has for them, and to call them to the faithful life. And he continues, verse 16, for we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. So here he references for them um, his experience of seeing Christ along with uh, the sons of Zebedee, James and John, on the Mount of Transfiguration. So he says, you know, we're not making this up. We're, when we make known to you the power, the dynamis, and the coming, the parousia of our Lord Jesus Christ, the power and coming of the Messiah, we're not making this up. We're not selling you stories. These aren't, as he calls them, cleverly devised myths. No. We've seen with our own eyes Christ in his glory. When he received honor and glory from God the Father, which is a reference to what? First to, it's a reference to what happened on the Mount of Transfiguration. And then ultimately, it's a reference to the resurrected Christ. When he received honor and glory from God the Father and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son, we ourselves heard this very voice from heaven. You remember he's referencing Mark chapter 9, Matthew chapter 17, Luke chapter 9, they all tell the same story of the transfiguration. And I put this in your notes, look at Mark chapter 9, verse 2. It's written, and after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, and he led them up a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured or transformed before them, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them, i.e. there was a a supernatural transformation that the Shekinah glory of God fell upon Christ. And the Shekinah glory is, it's an epiphany of God himself. It's the way that God revealed himself to Moses on Mount Sinai in this glorified state. He didn't, he wasn't in bodily form, but he was this brilliant, bright cloud. In the same way that cloud appears above uh, uh, the holy mountain, and then Jesus is transformed or transfigured in a way that is that is supernatural. And so it, you know 
when you're watching that happen, Peter, James, and John, that this is more than a, a carpenter rabbi from Nazareth. This is God incarnate right now. And Peter's saying, I've seen him with my own eyes. I wasn't making up the stuff that I told you about Jesus. And this is who he is. And then verse 19, we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So his reference um, here is to the fact that the things that they have told the church about Jesus are also the fulfillment of prophecies. And these are prophecies that they would have already shared with the church. Uh, here, speaking, thinking about this language of a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns, the morning star rises, uh, a reference to uh, Daniel, and then a, a reference not from Peter, but we have the same language that's used in Revelation 22, where Christ is referred to as the bright morning star. I just wanted to call your attention for a moment, though, to this beautiful alliterative language. He says, pay attention to this prophetic word that we have shared with you about Christ, about his coming, about his return in glory, about his teaching, about his lordship. You, he, he writes, you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. Like the world is a dark place and the lamp that is shining brightly is the gospel, is the gospel and the prophetic words spoken about the gospel. And another sort of metaphor, you will do well to pay attention as to, as until the day dawns, right? And the morning star rises in your heart. So pay attention. It's like the day, it's like the light coming up over the horizon. It's like the morning star rising in your heart. Pay attention to the things that we've taught you about the gospel, because it's like the lights coming on in a dark place, which is the world, which is also your heart apart from the Lord. That in your ignorance, your mind is a dark place until Christ is introduced and the lights come on of, aha, that's the story of us. That's the story of the world. That's the story of God. That's our reason for being. That's our purpose because God so loved the world that he gave his only son that all that believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So perhaps there was, you know, Peter's concern that there's people that are questioning the legitimacy of Old Testament prophecies or even some, some words of knowledge that they have shared with the church. And he's saying no, a, a true prophecy of scripture, it, it doesn't come from a person, it comes from God. No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. You could sort of add the word, no legitimate prophecy, no true prophecy. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that is speaking to people through human beings. But it's not their prophecy. It's God's prophecy that is spoken through them. And the word that's used here um, about someone's own interpretation is this word epilusis, which literally means a loosing or a setting free. That the, this prophecy of scripture is a, is, a, is a setting free of the truth. And then this last piece also really speaks to the authority of scripture. Um, he says, no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. We, we can also understand because he's writing this letter that, that he's saying that these prophecies that are written down for you i.e. Daniel, Revelation in the New Testament. This is, this is the Holy Spirit speaking through people. It's one of the ways in which we understand the integrity 
and the validity and the value of the Bible itself. The word that's used here, um, uh, it, when he says, as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit or moved by the Holy Spirit, is the word pheromonioi, which literally means to be born about. It's, it's that the Holy Spirit is bearing this word, and he is revealing it to human beings who are then sharing it with, with everyone else. So next week, we'll take a look at 2 Peter chapter 2. Just a little sneak peek. 2 Peter chapter 2, uh, Peter is going to really speak to some issues that clearly they're having in the church of false prophets and teachers who would do harm. And there's a sharp word of rebuttal and a word of correction that's wonderful, but we will hear that next week. For now, let us pray. Father, we thank you for time in your word. We pray, Lord, that as we continue to, to walk step by step uh, towards Christmas, that you would bless us. Bless us with good health. Bless our families and friends. Bless our community, our state, our nation, and our world. Help us to be free of this pestilence and to live without fear. Lord, um, we ask your special protection on those who are unwell. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.